Hi. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 104 of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson. I'm your host. For the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about stuff that I think is uh, worthy of your attention. You can contact me uh, with any comments or reactions to the show. The email address is whoviati, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, um, to, uh, to get the web address, to get the email address, rather, if you didn't catch it then. I want to tell you right off the top that um, I am going to be talking something about Boston and about the bombings at the Marathon, but I'm going to do that later in the show, after the break. Um, I'm going to get some, some other stuff first, but we will get to that. So I would actually like to start, if I could, with some good news. There's little of it enough these days, but uh, there is some. In this case, we've got some bit of good news on, uh, again, as it seems to happen a lot these days, the same-sex marriage issue. In this case, it's on the international front. Uh, last Friday, the French Senate uh, voted to legalize same-sex marriage in France. Um, it, uh, it, the bill now is expected to be passed. It has to go back through um, both houses of parliament because of some minor differences. You've got to reconcile the differences. But the expectation is that this will be law by the summer. Uh, France's justice minister, a man named Christine Taubira, said the reform, the reform, quote, will move our institutions toward ever more freedom, equality, and personal respect. The opposition to this, of course, came from the usual quarters, the right-wing reactionaries, and the conservative elements of the Roman Catholic Church. But um, the fact is that it looks like it's going to pass. France has actually had civil unions since 1999, uh, and they, in fact, are actually more popular with heterosexual couples than with same-sex couples. But the problem is um, the uh, civil union aspects uh, make no provisions for adoptions or things like that, and the law for marriage does. On another front, internationally, uh, last Wednesday, Uruguay became the second nation in South America to recognize same-sex marriage. Argentina was the first. The vote in the Chamber of Deputies was 71 to 21. Uh, apparently supporters of the law erupted in a loud celebration when the results were announced. The um, President Jose Mujica, who backed the law, uh, is expected, of course, to sign it. And um, the uh, same-sex marriages could start taking place in Uruguay as soon as mid-July. Among other changes in this law, one of the things it does is that it drops the terms husband and wife in laws related to marriage. Uh, repla it replaces the terms with contracting parties in all cases. And it also allows all couples, when they have children, to decide which parent's surname will go first. So there is some good news there. It's kind of weird, I suppose. It's, uh, in some ways, it seems kind of weird for us to be culturally behind Uruguay, but... Uh, Still, that's, that's good news. Uh, another bit of news comes in the matter of guns, about which there has been precious little good news again of late. The Supreme Court refused to hear an appeal of a decision from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, which upheld a century-old New York State law which said that people can't carry a handgun in public without demonstrating an actual need. The Court of Appeals ruled that restriction does not violate the Second Amendment, noting what it called, quote, a long-standing tradition of states regulating firearm possession and use in public because of the dangers posed to public safety, and declaring that outside the home, public safety interests often outweigh individual interests in self-defense. This decision actually was a real smackdown to the uh, NRA and other assorted gun nuts, Unfortunately, it may just be temporary. Uh, the federal appeals court are divided on this particular issue. While New York, uh, the, the court in New York ruled that way, uh, and another appeals court upheld a Maryland law, which requires a good and substantial reason for having a handgun in public, another appeals court in Illinois struck down an Illinois law that felt the same, uh, has argued the same thing, saying that violated the Second Amendment. Sooner or later, the Supreme Court is going to have to take this up in order to resolve the dispute. And by the way, just as a footnote to this, in 1981, just three states, Maine, Washington, and Vermont, allowed typical residents to carry a gun in public. Today, about 40 do. 
You know, at some point, I swear that at some point, either we are going to turn into Somalia or some future Supreme Court at some future time is going to declare that the decisions that opened these floodgates were wrongly decided and reverse them. All right, another bit of good news. Try to keep our spirits up here. Uh, Vermont's House of Representatives has passed a bill to decriminalize marijuana possession for adults. Uh, it passed by a vote of 92 to 49. It now goes to the Senate, where it's expected to be passed by an equally wide margin. And Governor Peter Schmullen, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Shumlin rather, uh, has called this, uh, making this kind of change a top priority for this legislative session. So he, of course, is expected to sign it. According to a fiscal note that uh, uh, Vermont attaches to bills like this, this change is expected to save the state $400,000 a year. And finally, a bit of technology good news. The White House has issued a veto threat against CISPA, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act. This is a bill that allows for sharing of data, including potentially personal data, between private corporations and the government. The bill died in, Senate, in the Senate last year over privacy concerns, but was dragged from the grave like a zombie this year. Uh, it's got some token improvements, but the basic objections to the bill remain. Uh, it has, a, in fact, a very broad definition of what kind of information can be shared from gov from between government agencies and private corporations. In a statement about this, the White House said the administration, quote, remains concerned that the bill does not require private entities to take reasonable steps to remove irrelevant personal information when sending cybersecurity data to the government or other private sector entities, and that citizens have a right to know the corporations will be held accountable and not granted immunity for failing to safeguard personal information adequately. Now, Representative Mike Rogers, who is the bill's chief sponsor in the House, he's dismissed opponents of the law as teenagers living in their basements. Uh, but among the opponents are not only the White House, but the ACLU and other civil liberties groups, uh, Facebook and Microsoft. The bill will actually likely pass the House. So uh, let's hope the amazing Mr. O has a stiffer spine here than he has shown in other cases. All right, from good news, we switch over to our regular weekly feature, the Clown Award, given for acts of meritorious stupidity. And uh, I had a lot of good candidates this week, I really did. For one, we had Representative Joe Smokey Joe Barton, who got the nickname uh, because he's pretty much owned by the petrochemical industry. He said that climate change has nothing to do with people because the biblical flood was, he said, an example of climate change and that certainly wasn't because mankind had overdeveloped hydrocarbon energy. Apparently something else that's not overdeveloped is Smokey Joe's grasp of logic. We also have Ken Cuccinelli, he's the Attorney General of the State of Virginia. Last month, a uh, three-judge panel of the uh, Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the state's ban on sodomy is unconstitutional because of the Supreme Court's 2003 decision in Lawrence v. Texas. Cuccinelli has now filed an appeal with the court asking the entire 15-judge court to rehear the case. That is, he wants them to overturn this ruling in order to allow Virginia to continue to prosecute people for what its laws call crimes against nature. But here's our winner. Our winner of the big red nose this week is one third of the adult population of the United States. According to a new poll by Huffington Post and YouGov, 34% of American adults would favor establishing Christianity as the official state religion of their state. 32% said that they would favor a constitutional amendment making Christianity the official religion of the United States. Now, I will note that in the first case, a plurality of 47% opposed the idea, and in the other, a majority of 52% rejected it. But that doesn't change the fact that a third, according to this poll, a third of American adults are so ignorant of our own history as to be prepared to jettison not only that history, but 200 years of progress toward inclusion, religious tolerance, and religious freedom, and reprise the mistakes of the past in order to redefine religious freedom as your freedom to believe the same things they do. 
Just as disturbing, 11% of the people in the survey thought the Constitution allowed states to establish their own state religion. Another 31% weren't sure. Now, whether that's just plain old average everyday ignorance, or if it's the result of the reactionaries pressing their tenther arguments, this is about the claim of state sovereignty under the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, I don't know what it is. But in either event, the sheer level of ignorance is frightening. It's clownish, but it's frightening. From there to our other regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. In Texas, applicants for TANF, T-A-N-F, that's Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, that's what we used to call welfare. Applicants for TANF can receive an average of a whopping $70 a month per person in the household. In exchange for that, participants must sign a so-called personal responsibility contract involving requirements including things like child support, uh, school attendance, parenting classes, medical screenings, and immunization for the children. Now, that level of humili humiliating presumption and condescension toward poor people, regarding them as people who will only take care of their own children if they're forced to, apparently in the eyes of the glorious leaders of the state of Texas was insufficient. It was insufficient punishment for being poor. On Wednesday, April 10th, the state legislature, uh, currently consisting of 19 Republicans and 12 Democrats, passed a bill which mandates that every Texan applying for food assistance under TANF must submit to an undefined screening process and a possible drug test before receiving any benefits if this screener finds good cause that the suspect, the suspect, may or might in the future abuse some controlled substance. It passed unanimously. It was one of seven such bills introduced this year. One of those bills actually wanted to extend this requirement to unemployment assistance. This despite the fact that the manifest failure and utter pointlessness of these kind of programs. These slaps in the face of the poor have been demonstrated to be failures over and over and over again. You know, Michigan ran a pilot program in 1999, the first state to do so, of random drug testing. Uh, and, but in the state appeals court, shut it down in 2003, saying that suspicious searching is unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. Florida also ran a pilot program uh, beginning in 1999, but decided two years later it wasn't worth the expense or the invasiveness of the program, so they killed it. Even so, in 2010, Florida Governor Rick Voldemort Scott got approval of a requirement for urine tests for all applicants for state aid. Two federal court rulings have smacked down this program, including one just in February that, uh, that the program violated the Fourth Amendment by not showing a substantial need for it. The court said, quoting, there is nothing inherent in the condition of being impoverished that supports a conclusion that there is a concrete danger that impoverished individuals are prone to drug use. And in fact, there is no evidence at all that being poor makes you more likely to do drugs. I mean, consider that Florida program. It was in place for four months. During that four months, only 40 out of over 4,000 applicants for state aid d uh, dropped out, not, not being willing to take the drug test after completing the uh, application. Of those that were tested, only 2.6% tested positive. That's a rate of drug use, one third of that of the general population, according to federal government estimates. Florida spent more on the test than it saved by denying benefits to people who tested positive. But despite this kind of manifest failure, it goes on and on and on. Seven states have enacted similar laws, and according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, 29 states this year are considering such measures. The rich and the powerful really, really do despise the poor. It's not new. But it is an outrage, and we're taking a break.
And we're back. Okay, Boston. I won't bother you with the details about this. I mean, you, I know you've heard them over and over again. Two bomb blasts, 100 yards and about 10 seconds apart uh, near the finish lines of the Boston Marathon. Uh, as of Wednesday morning, there were three dead, 183 hospitalized, 17 of them in critical condition. The first and most important thing you have to keep in mind right now, though, um, after, after you know, our concern and our sympathies to the, uh, to the dead and the injured and their families and friends, but beyond that, the most important thing to keep in mind is that as of when I'm doing this, which is about 3 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, um, we don't know who did this and we don't know why. As of this point, authorities say there were no, there's no one arrested, they don't have anybody in custody. So we don't know who or why. We do have some idea of how. The bombs are apparently fashioned out of, uh, at least one of them out of an ordinary pressure cooker, the other out of some metal container. One of them was packed with nails, the other with apparently BBs or ball bearings. Um, they were hidden in black nylon duffel bags and just left on the ground. They were probably triggered by um, sensors, triggered by a cell phone. The FBI said that debris and evidence was found in local stores and even on roofs, which shows you that these were pre actually pretty powerful blasts. But again, we don't know who, we don't know why. The thing is, there's no obvious target here. There's no obvious purpose except to kill people. There's no obvious political or economic motive here. Uh, in fact, late Tuesday afternoon, Richard Deslaurier, I think it's how you pronounce it, he's the special agent in charge of the FBI office in Boston. He said, quoting, the range of suspects and motives remains wide open. And in fact, officials have been admirably cautious. They have been admirably careful in not hinting about things which they don't know. And in fact, we don't even know, technically at this point, we didn't even know if legally this would be called terrorism. I mean, it certainly feels like terrorism. And everybody and their relatives are calling it terrorism, and I'm going to call it terrorism. But the U.S. Criminal Code says that terrorism is, and I'm quoting, premeditated, politically motivated violence perpetrated against non-combatant targets. That is, legally, under the law, terrorism must have a political motive. And a motive is what we don't have here. Now, re reasonably, officials say that when there are multiple devices, such as there were here, they treat it as terrorism unless they learn otherwise. But the point right now remains, we don't know what the motive is, much less who it was. But of course, that didn't prevent the pundits and politicos from engaging at one, what, what one website accurately called the long-standing American tradition of groundless political speculation. For example, on MSNBC, Chris Matthews suggested a tie-in to the fact that it was April 15th, tax day, uh, suggesting a right-wing anti-government motive. Charles Pierce of Esquire magazine said that nobody knows anything yet, but said that people should consider the possibility of right-wing violence. But to what should have been no one's surprise, it was the right wing that jumped all over this with presumptions and prejudices blazing away. For them, it was Muslims, first, last, and always. Rupert Murdoch's scandal sheet, the New York Post, and to show you how old I am, I remember when the New York Post was a reputable newspaper. The New York Post reported falsely that a Saudi national was being held under guard at a Boston hospital. The report was eagerly seconded by Fox News, which is also owned by Murdoch. Uh, they were undeterred by the fact that um, Boston police repeatedly denied that there was anybody in custody, anybody under guard. So the Daily Caller's White House correspondent, a guy named Neil Monroe, ran with the Post story, which he illustrated with a montage of the 9-11 hijackers. Meanwhile, anti-Islam blogger Pam Geller uh, repeatedly referred to the Boston bombing as jihad. World Nut Daily columnist and Fox News commentator Eric Rush responded to the bombings by tweeting, Everybody do the national security ankle grab. Let's bring in more Saudis without screening them. Challenged by someone who asked if he was already blaming Muslims, he replied, Yes, they're evil. Let's kill them all. He later rather lamely claimed he was being sarcastic, something which I doubt anybody actually believed. Brian Fisher of the right-wing hate group, the American Family Association, tweeted in reference to the Post story, anybody want to rethink Muslim immigration? 
In fact, for them, it had to be Muslims. It had to be, no other possibility was allowed. When a CNN analyst, he was asked on the network to speculate on who might have done this, he said, reasonably enough, said, well, we should wait to find out what kind of device was used. He, he said, if it's this kind of device, then it probably might have been Al-Qaeda or some offshoot. But if it's this other kind of device, it may well have been a right-wing group, right-wing domestic group. He was slammed by both Newsbusters and Breitbart.org, which are these right-wing outfits that pretend to be about news. Uh, he was slammed by them for even mentioning the possibility that there could have been a right-wing source of the bombing. But even beyond the knee-jerk uh, anti-Muslim bigotry of the right wing, there stands Alex Jones, a man who gives wacko a bad name. He said the bombing stink to high heaven of a false flag operation. In other words, he's saying the government planted the bombs, blew them up in order to justify further attacks on civil liberties. Uh, he was joined in that particular paranoia by former Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, somebody who I actually used to respect before she went flaky on us. She, she saw the attack as an inside job by the Boston police. So I have to say, I have to say again, I don't know who did it, I don't know why they did it. But I have a hope, and I'll tell you why. I have a hope that this was a right-wing attack, and I have two reasons for that. One, if it's a right-wing attack, we won't go bomb or invade some foreign country and kill a lot of innocent people who had nothing to do with it, like we did in Iraq. And plus the fact that right-wing terrorism does not seem to be used to attack civil liberties in this country the way foreign terrorism is. So for the sake of the lives of people in other countries and our own civil liberties, I hope this is a right-wing attack. And there's been no shortage of right-wing terrorism in the United States in the past few decades. I mean, we didn't have to count the bombings of abortion clinics, the murder of abortion doctors and nurses, including by serial bomber Eric Rudolph. And yes, that is terrorism because it has a political purpose of putting an end to the right to abortion in the United States. But there's even beyond that, there, there's more. There's a lot more. Now, for one thing, I mean, you know about the Oklahoma City bombing back in 1995. You know about that. But consider this. While I bet you do recall the failed so-called underwear bomber in 2009 and the failed Times Square bombing in 2010, both of which were tied to Muslim extremism, um, do you recall ever hearing about a 1997 plot by the Ku Klux Klan to blow up a Texas oil refinery which could have killed 30,000 people in the vicinity? Have you, ever, have you ever heard of William Krar? In 2002, he and two others were arrested in a storeroom in Tyler, Texas, along with 500,000 rounds of ammunition, 65 pipe bombs and briefcases that could be detonated by remote control, and 80 grams of almost pure sodium cyanide packed in an ammunition canister next to a variety of acids and bomb-making formulas. Mixed with the appropriate acid, such a cyanide bomb could have killed everyone in a 30,000-square-foot building. Have you even heard of him? Look at this. Look at this. What does this picture suggest to you? Yes, it's a black bag. It's a black nylon backpack, kind that might have been used uh, in the Boston bombings. But this one didn't come from Boston. This backpack came from Spokane, Washington. This is the FBI photo of a bomb that was packed with lead weights soaked in rat poison that was placed on a bench alongside the planned route of a Martin Luther King Day march in Spokane in 2010. Kevin Harfum, a white supremacist neo-Nazi, later pled, uh, pled guilty to planting the bomb. Do you remember him? Have you even heard of the nearly 40 major conspiracies of right-wing violence, right-wing terrorism that have been uncovered since Oklahoma City? So has there been right-wing terrorism in this country? Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes, there has been, despite the lying attempts of the right-wing to deny and to dismiss the idea. So could Boston have been right-wing terrorism? Yes, absolutely. Was it? We don't know. Now, I'll tell you what I think. 
because far be it from me to not take part in that grand old American tradition of baseless speculation. And I admit that what I think may be, may be affected by what earlier I said I hope and what I think is open to revision as new information comes in. But this is like 3 o'clock Wednesday afternoon. This is what I think. I think at the end of the day, this will turn out to have been right-wing terrorism. The main argument for it be foreign terrorism is the kind of bombs used, which have been used in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. But since 2010, the information of how to make these bombs has been actively spread by al-Qaeda in Yemen. It's, if you want to find out how to do this, you can. On the other hand, Muslim extremists have never been shy about claiming responsibility for their attacks, which is reasonable. They're doing it for political purpose. You can't advance that purpose if people don't know what it is. Um, in fact, there have been cases of competing claims of, uh, of responsibilities. Even at least one case, the bombings in Spain back in 2004, when they said that uh, an Arab, uh, uh, an Arab terrorist group, uh, it was an Arab group, claimed responsibility when it had nothing to do with it. And in fact, the lack of a claim of responsibility in this case might be telling. The Pakistani Taliban, who took responsibility for the failed 2010 bombing in Times Square, has specifically said they have nothing to do with this. And I think something else. I think something else. At a moment like this, and an event like this, it's normal, it's typical, it's natural to reflect on the darkness in the human soul. And it's true that we humans are capable of great evil, great destructiveness, and it's possible that in some of the things we do, we, any of us, all of us, may be impelled by greed or selfishness or bigotry or fear or whatever to a greater degree than we are aware or are prepared to acknowledge. But for that very reason, it's important at a moment like this that we remind ourselves that we are also capable of soaring achievement of glorious creativity, of astonishing self-sacrifice. We can hate, but we can love. We can be narrow and ignorant and bigoted, but we can learn. We can tie ourselves to the muck and mud, or we can reach for the stars. We are, all of us, a mixture of the light and the dark, the good and the bad, the just and the cruel. We are none of us, all good or all bad. With the exception of that happily tiny uh, sliver of people whose personal demons or mental malfunctions render them unable to recognize or care about the evil in their own actions. Except for that tiny handful, we are, all of us, a mixture, a balance, a sometimes easy uh, uh, coalition of dark urges hidden under and controlled by conscience. So we have to, we must resist the easy, the facile, the false division of humanity into angels and demons. The issue is not who is an angel, who is a demon, because we all are angels, we all are demons. We are both and we are neither, but at any moment with the capacity to be either. So the issue for us as humans on a day-to-day -day basis is not to say I'm an angel or I'm a demon, but to ask yourself every day, which side of that divide are you on? That's it for this week. We will see you next week, hopefully with better news, I'm sure with an update on this, but we have the best week you can. We'll see you then.